Good evening and welcome to Chill TV's 2021 School Board Election Debate. I'm your host, Clint Hames, and it's my pleasure to welcome the debate to the Chilliwack Vineyard Community Centre. We're very pleased to be able to use this facility. Chilliwack Vineyard Community Centre is one of our sponsors, as is Citizen Notaries. Tonight, we welcome three of the four candidates for the school board election. Adam Suleiman is not able to be with us tonight by his choice. The other three are here in studio. In the studio in which uh, we will uh, observe all COVID protocols, we have enough room to do that. And so we're here safe and we're excited to get started. The three candidates we have in studio, of course, are Richard Procy, Brian Van Garderen, and Karen Bondar. We'll be asking them questions throughout the evening. The process tonight will be, I'll give the candidates each three minutes to introduce themselves, and then we'll start with the question and answer section. Question and answer section will be, I will ask one of the candidates a question that you, our audience, has sent to us through Facebook and through involvement on our webpage. We'll ask the candidates each questions. They will have two minutes for a response to the question I've selected for them. Each of the other two candidates will have a minute to also offer comment or to rebut the answers of other candidates. That will be the format through the evening. We hope to get to four questions for each candidate to give you a really good idea of how they feel about things. And again, I stress those questions have come from you, our faithful Facebook followers and people who watch Chill TV, for which we're very grateful. So let's start then with our first candidate. First candidate will be Karen Bondar. Uh, these names were selected randomly, and Karen's going to tell us a little bit about herself. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Clint. I am Karen Bondar. I am a scientist, a biologist, and science communicator, and I'm also a mom of four. I have four children that currently go to school in our district. Uh, my platform centralizes around four main issues, the first of which is uh, I would like to see uh, a school board that works highly collaboratively and in communication with each other. And this is something that I'm quite familiar with having worked in uh, diverse areas of art and science, uh, bringing diverse ideas together and communicating them well. But it's really important to recognize the collaborative nature of communication because it's a matter of of there being at least two parties talking and actively listening to each other. This is something that I make sure to model for all of my students. Secondly, um, I think it's really important to have a very diverse uh, and inclusive curriculum. Students learn in a multitude of ways. I know my own children have very diverse learning styles. Um, one is an active learner. She needs to be up and moving and, and really experiencing things to understand them. Uh, some of my other kids are more book learners or even digital learners. So there's a lot of formats and there's a lot of diversity. And this is something that really needs to be recognized in our rapidly growing district. Thirdly, I would uh, come back to that point again and say that our rapidly growing district, second only to the school district of Surrey, uh, means that we have a hugely diverse population. And it's, it's really important for us to be uh, aware of cultural differences that exist and understand each other in a compassionate way. Um, I think teaching with pedagogical values that involve compassion and an understanding for what a student's experience has been up to that point is really critically important. And then fourthly, I am a scientist and science communicator, as I've said, and I think it's really key to bring science literacy and an understanding of the scientific method to our classrooms. In today's digital world, where our students can literally get the answer to any question on their devices, I think we really have to look at critical thinking skills and the powers that our students have to observe things, create a way to test things and collect data in a systematic way. All of our students have the power to do this and I'm really a champion of them thinking for themselves and uh, making decisions based on that. So all of those uh, four pillars are the central ideas in my platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard Procy. Hello. My name is Richard Procy. Um, I'm going to give you a bio of who I am. So I was born in um, Ontario, in Burlington, Ontario. I grew up on a farm, a mixed farm, 100 acres of rocks and trees and animals. I, I loved school. I was uh, 
um, one of those guys that uh, would, would uh, the bus driver would have to stop and remind me to get off the bus because I loved reading. So I went to school, and then as I got older, I went to um, Guelph for an agriculture program, but I didn't like it. And so then I, I dropped out of that, and then I went to McMaster and graduated with a degree in English. And um, from there, I went to the East Coast, and I dipped my foot in the Atlantic Ocean. And then from there, I came out west because my sister lived in Chilliwack, and I wanted to dip my foot in the Pacific Ocean. And so I came to Chilliwack. And interesting enough, when I came to Chilliwack, I ran out of money, so I got a job. And then I also became part of the community here. I started working in the construction industry. I did that for three years. Then I met the Hofstads family. And um, I worked with the Hofstads family for a few months because I noticed they had a cute daughter. And that happened to be Tara. And then Tara and I got married. And then we had six children. And we have one boy left in uh, the school. All of our four of them are married. Uh, one's um, almost out of the house. And one of them is just completing his studies at uh, CSS. <laughs> in Chilliwack here, so that's the last one that we have in school. I've been uh, involved with the family, um, the Hofstra's family business for 24 years. It's been um, uh, a wonderful experience. It's been a wonderful uh, time. Chilliwack's a pretty amazing place, and I'm just thankful that I can be here today to um, hopefully share some of my ideas and visions with you guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Richard. Our third candidate is Brian Van Garderen. Brian? Hi, I'm Brian Van Garderen. Uh, I'm running for the school district trustee position. I'm a teacher currently in the Abbotsford School District where I work with students who are deaf and hard of hearing and I support their many learning needs that come along with that. Um, I also have a 10 month old daughter who I cherish beyond belief, but I mean, I'm also exhausted because of that too. Um, as, as we began to think about what she's gonna be involved in the community and where she's gonna to go to school, I started thinking about how can I become more involved in the community and, and I was looking into becoming a part of the pack and how I can volunteer for schools and then I saw the trustees in the news and I started doing my research and realized, well, I have the education background, I have that experience and so I wanna put my name forward because I think I can make a difference. Things that I stand for and believe behind, or that I believe are inclusivity and I've always believed that and my career has been solely based on that. I have worked in a classroom with a special needs group of kids where I would work with them and adapt programming and create meaningful classes. I also worked at a school level where I'd support multiple classrooms and teachers how to manage students' behaviors, how to give breaks, how to make sure that the appropriate academic programming was there for them. And now I'm working at a district level as well where I go to 14 schools a week and I get to see how each school runs and interacts with each other. And one of the biggest things that I think I can bring to the table is that understanding of how the entire school system runs. You have so many moving parts of parents and support staff and teachers and principals and community members that all have a say and all have a want to be involved in the student's education. And their voices need to be heard and that's something that I wanna to bring to the table if I become trustee. It's making sure that all parties are present when making these important policy decisions and making sure that they're heard and noticed when we guide our community schools in the right direction. Thank you so much. You were all very good. Didn't need to get dinged for running over time. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. We're going to start with our questions then. Uh, you have two minutes to answer these questions. And as I said before, the other candidates may wish to offer a comment on your answer or a comment on their own thoughts. And they'll have one minute to do that. First question. Uh, selected again randomly uh, is to Karen Bondar. And as I say, sometimes these questions were, uh, they asked us to ask specific candidates. Sometimes they're just general questions. If there's a specific question uh, that was asked by one of our uh, viewers, then I will announce that. This first question was, in fact, asked of uh, Karen Bondar. Karen, the current school board of trustees appears divided on many issues. Do you see your role as creating a majority position on the board so that specific agenda or values base can move forward? Are you truly willing to work with all the trustees? You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I see my role as being a member of the school board and a school board trustee that works to serve 
all of our students. And so to that end, I'm absolutely wanting to come to the table, discuss issues, and give everybody the right and freedom to discuss uh, the issues at hand. I, I think it's important that not only do we take the opportunity to uh, collaborate together, but we also take the important time to listen to one another and to understand the aspects of what someone is saying and the importance that they perceive it to have. I think my experience in diverse areas of art and science and media and school teaching um, have prepared me to, to welcome very diverse viewpoints, uh, very diverse sets of experiences, and I think um, all of these things will arm me very well to come to the table as a collaborative member, somebody who wants to do, uh, do work, to actively get things done, accomplish what needs to be accomplished for the benefit of the students in our district. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, would you like to comment uh, on any of the uh, question or on what you've heard? Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Brian, any comments on that specific question or uh, thoughts of your own on yeah. that? Uh, Karen, I just, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, hostility right now that it feels like when it comes to the different viewpoints on the board. And it is important to make sure that we acknowledge everybody's thoughts and understanding. But there is a time that I feel where we do need to stand up and say, this is not appropriate anymore, and it's no longer the focus of the kids. Do you agree that that's something that you would be able to uh, push for and redirect some of those other comments that are brought up to you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Brian. I think that there's definitely a lot of hostility happening, and I think that um, what I would do to, to bring these situations forward and to actually leave that hostility behind is to lead by example. Um, and to really um, never take that tone, never take that, that route, uh, and to be someone who is uh, a demonstrating a great way to collaborate uh, and to come together. I, uh, I don't want to wade into those, those issues, but when it comes necessary, I, I don't have a problem doing so. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question was also uh, specifically asked to be asked, uh, to be asked of, a, of a candidate, uh, Richard Procy. Uh, the SOGI 123 resource was established and settled policy in all districts in BC. If elected, would you seek to reopen the debate and why? Well, SOGI, uh, SOGI 123 is a resource, as you mentioned, and that's one of those um, areas where um, there are some, I don't know if I'd be allowed to open it up. I don't know if, uh, if, if, if it's mandated from the provincial government whether I'd be allowed to open it up. But I would, would like to say, on, on speaking of SOGI 123, is it's an example of um, how cautious and careful we have to be as, as, um, as a government and as introducing certain ideologies into the school system that we include um, the kids, the, the, the ideas of the kids, the parents in particular, the parents had the... I think the parents lost out on some of these uh, resources that are available. So I would, like to, um, I would like to look at that and say, let's use it as an example of a government policy that missed the vote in so many ways, that they missed, the, missed the, um, the, um, the ideas of parents, missed the um, inclusion of parents, missed the inclusion of, of the teachers and their views on it and stuff like that. So I think even though the safety of the, the children will always be my concern, the safety of the children will always be my biggest um, mandate in, in any situation, but the SOGI 123, I believe, was, uh, was um, not poorly um, brought forth. Thank you. Uh, comments, uh, Karen? I disagree with Richard's position on that. Uh, the SOGI 123 Year Learning Resource is uh, provided to our teachers and is mandated through the Ministry of Education. It is not um, an item that is currently actionable by the board. Uh, we don't have any say in that. And essentially, reopening any kind of discussion about it uh, will just take up valuable time that we could be using for other aspects, uh, positive aspects for our students. Sexual identity, um, gender, sexual identity, and uh, sexual preference is an individual right to all of our students. And it's really important that we take that inclusive stance and we stop trying to label or misread uh, things that are different, not necessarily bad, but different. The end. Thank you. Brian, any comments? 
I think it's important for us to realize that there is a community out there that feels that they've been forgotten, uh, oppressed, neglected, and Soju123 is that resource that brings it to the front and makes them feel like they do matter and what they feel and what they believe do matter and that's a part of what that resource is doing. And it's also breaking down those barriers of uh, poor language being used and discrimination against a group that definitely needs to have their voice because they have been silent for a long time. And so it's important for us to make sure that resource is available so that students that are feeling that way or want to identify that way need to have support in the system and not feel neglected or forgotten. Thank you so much. The third question in this first section is to Brian Van Garderen. Brian, what issues do you see as issues facing students with high support needs and their families? How could the school district provide better supports? Yeah, this is a very complex question. I could go into it for a very long time. One of the biggest things that I believe in is inclusion. And what inclusion means is we can keep our students in their local community schools and provide the necessary supports to them. And whether that's staffing, whether that's building proper programming or educating our staff members or even giving training sessions so that they feel confident to be able to deliver a great education to every single student. And if we we don't have that confidence in our staff and in our teachers, then it feels like there is a, a, a lagging of that inclusion. And so, of course, there are always going to be exceptions when it comes to complex needs of students. And so we need to be careful as well that we don't push something that isn't going to be successful for every student. Sometimes we might have to find a different school or a different program that is a better fit. And those need to be available as well. And so I'm, I will always push for the student to be remaining in their local community and us providing as much support as needed for those kids. But there are always those exceptions. Thank you. Richard, any comments on that question or views you might also have? But just um, refer to um, what, would you, what would you do if a student was, like, where would you bring them or where would you bring them? What were you saying that there is, what would be the last resort you would do? Yeah, so there are some times where a very complex or high needs uh, student is in a school. Sometimes what they need is an alternate environment. And so that if they're blowing up because they're having too many classmates around them or there's too much stimulus, sometimes there are needs where there might need to be a separate sensory room or there might need to be an extra staff member for those students. And some schools do have those programs available. And so it might even be for those students that are wheelchair bound and need to be changed and need to have those personal care, uh, personal hygiene care for them. And having that, uh, having those areas available to them with the proper equipment and facilities, that's what I'm referring to where they might have to go to a different school to have those needs met. Thank you. Uh, Karen, any comments? Thanks for your work in that area, Brian. It's really important and it's something that we need to look at individualized educational plans that work for including all of our students, including those with diverse needs. Um, I would also add to that, that at this point in our district and all over our province, there's a huge need for additional mental health supports for our students. And so uh, getting in there with the appropriate resources to be able to get them through this year course and all of their years of education is really important. Thank you so much. That's the end of our first section, and it went well, and I compliment you all for your courtesy to each other. That uh, makes my job so much easier. <laughs> uh, we're going to take just a, we're just going to take a quick break, and we're going to be back with round two questions. Thanks so much. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is round two of our questions of the candidates, Richard Procy, Brian Van Garderen, and Karen Bondar. Karen, the next question is for you. 
the school board has recently announced their budgets will require in excess of $800,000 infusion of cash to balance the budget. And that number could be even higher next year. There's discussion about advancing funds from reserves. There's discussions about how we creatively finance this year. Um, it would seem essentially the choice is going to be in the future between cuts to facilities uh, that are planned into the future or cuts to services. What's your solution to that dilemma the board faces? This is a big issue, and I think that considering that Chilliwack is one of the fastest growing districts in our province, uh, as trustees, we have to advocate for as much financial um, compensation as we can get from our government. I think it is important that we look forward to not just the needs that we have currently, but as far as the plans that we make for more infrastructure, more schools, um, plans to accommodate more students, we have to look at how rapidly our district is growing. So um, I don't think that it's a necessary evil of having to cut something at this point. I think what we have to do is get a little more creative Creative. I know that we do have to balance the budget and we do have to find that money from somewhere. Uh, however, I don't think that we have to take it directly away from students and their ability to learn. We currently have among the highest number of portables and overcrowding in our district as it is. And so um, asking for even more cuts to our budget at this point is definitely going to be a tricky conversation. Um, and one that I am certainly interested in working on. It's not going to be easy, but it, the important aspect is to come to the table knowing we have important work to do uh, and coming to a good solution that will ultimately be the best one for all of our students. Thank you. Richard, any comments uh, of your own on that particular issue or comments yeah, on what think, Karen has said? I think you're right. I think um, um, Karen has a valid point there. Like the, but I think the, uh, another problem is, is that we're not allowed to build according to demographic growth. Mm -hmm. So we're not allowed to get resources or money for future schools. And so we have an influx of students, like Karen mentioned, that we are one of the fastest growing districts. And the problem is, is that we're I put an addition on GW Graham, but by the time that addition is done, we're still gonna be short. Like, so the, the, the reality is that we're dealing with this portable issue right now, and we're dealing with all these things. So um, it, almost, it almost requires maybe a little bit of a, a, a longer range thinking process. Maybe we can work it out with the provincial government or something that we can start looking at demographics and saying, is it a possibility of of allowing us to push ahead a little bit further and faster. Thank you. Brian, comments? Yeah, I mean, Karen and Richard, you both have the right idea. It's important for us to acknowledge the fact that there are certain uh, mandates done by the BC education that doesn't allow you to do for future growth. And you're right, Chilliwack is growing like crazy. And so one of the things that we should do as trustees is we should start pushing for how do we accommodate this fast growth that's going on, especially in Chilliwack. I mean, families are coming out from all over <laughs> Vancouver and the area. They're coming out and they're living here because it is more affordable. What also comes with more needs and higher needing more staff and so that's where you fall into budget shortages and so making sure that we address those issues as well is important. Thank you. The second question is to Richard. Richard, there's a bit of a perception and I picked this up when I uh, chat with trustees and I picked this up when I chat with the public that trustees get to roll up their sleeves and help and the reality is trustees have a limited role providing governance and assisting with policy development. Many of you have talked about being leaders, but that's from the perspective of being doers, people that do things in the community. But what actual governance experience have you had that leads you to a position as a policymaker or sitting in governance of a system? Well, that, that's a pretty good question. Uh, you're right, you're right. A lot of times we think as trustees that we, we come up with all these um, ideas in our mind of what we can do and, and, and uh, what we can wave, wave around a wand that we can wave around and, and, and fix problems. But you're right, a lot of our work is policy. A lot of our work is uh, financial statements. It's a, a lot of our work is uh, working in a corporate board, like we're working as a corporate board. It's actually, um, a trustee is actually uh, a lot of just hard work. I don't know how else to look at it. Like I look at, I look look at the whole thing. Now, what do I offer in that? Business experience, 25 years in business, uh, run my own company. I think that gives me an advantage on a, on, a, on a business level of understanding. There's also the perspective that I've worked on local boards and on local committees in, um, in, in, in within the community. So I have, I have a good um, basis of how a board operates and how it works. 
Thank you. Uh, Karen, comments on that? Yeah, the, the role of a trustee is an extremely important one. As Richard said, we draw on a lot of our experiences as leaders, as directors, as people with experience in governance or um, managing rules and uh, the way systems function. I would say that as a school trustee, it's important that we switch hats uh, sometimes from being the doers to being the communicators and to actually listen to all of the needs of diverse players in the school board system. Uh, in the school system, pardon me, we have students, parents, teachers, administrators, support staff. These are massive um, entities that require us to communicate, to listen to each other, uh, and to, to sometimes you know, hold our own personal uh, ideas on things that make it for the good of the team. Brian, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I agree with both Richard and Karen, I, I do think though that we are all doers on this stage, but we could still do that as a trustee. We can still be a part of those committees, a part of those community groups. We have our PACs, we have our, uh, we have our LSS support staff, and being a part of those, uh, those uh, entities, you can help be on the front lines. You can help guide and be that shining example. So I think you're right, it is a part of us setting the policies, but we can also choose to be those doers. Thank you. The next question is uh, for Brian. Are there any school districts or provinces or countries that you've looked at uh, in your research to becoming a trustee or in your research becoming a teacher that you feel provide a great example of how education could be improved in Chilliwack. <laughs> uh, uh, you're, are you asking me a question of how, can, how I would like to change the guidance of curriculum and how schools should operate? Because that's a massive question again. So um, yeah, I mean, you always look at different examples. I mean, you have countries like in South Korea who have a very strict and rigid style of education and they're one of the leaders of outcomes of knowledge and information and but then you also have education systems like in Sweden which are a lot uh, relaxed and and have a lot more uh, curricular or extracurricular activities and also the timing isn't the same and so I mean you have to draw on everything that you see but BC is also known as a leader of education as well and I think that's something that we can be proud of especially living here and in the Fraser Valley and especially in Chilliwack we can say that we're proud of how we develop towards inclusivity and how we push towards our kids critical thinking and making sure that they they make those informed decisions I think that's something that we can be proud of as well so drawing on all of them for sure but as BC I am proud of how we are as with our education thank you Karen any comments yeah, I agree. I, I travel extensively. I've done research in many countries in the world, and I have an idea of how different countries do public school, and Canada is a leader in the public school system, and I completely agree with Brian. I'm proud of the public system in our country and certainly in our province, um, and, and I think that while we absolutely are dealing with issues that are local to us as far as our specific local smaller-scale needs, um, as a whole, the education system of Canada is, is world-renowned. Thank you. Richard, comments? Yeah, I think um, Chilliwack does have a, an excellent um, school system. I have never, our, 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 I've never seen anything in the, in the school system that would cause me any serious concerns. Uh, the teachers do an amazing job with so many of the, um, the students, and especially um, they really do care. I, I cannot, but I see that all the time. I see teachers just, we have a, a our community actually has a very strong um, value. Our teachers have very strong values. They're very committed to our kids. When I worked in the scholarship committees in that view, I, I could not believe the level of students that were out there. And they weren't all academic either. They were a lot of them just amazing students, but amazing because the, the teachers cared. There was a real sense of, of loyalty towards the students. So I, I do appreciate our system. Again, I'm, I'm always thinking in terms of, um, you know, reading and writing and you know, we, we read so we can, uh, we learn to read. We read to learn, and we learn, or no, we learn to read, and we read to learn. <laughs> so I'm a firm believer in the basic principles of establishing that and then grow from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've come to the end of <laughs> another we section. Too long, man. So uh, <laughs> we'll take another quick break, and we'll be back with more questions of our candidates in just a second.
Welcome back, everyone. We're here at the Vineyard Community Center in beautiful downtown Chilliwack with our candidates. And one of the reasons we're able to do this is uh, because of our sponsor, uh, Simpson Notaries. So I'd like to sh say a shout out to them at this time. We're going to go back to our questions now. We'll start again with Karen Bondar. Karen, there are policy arguments for and against the notion of enrichment or gifted programs. Why would you favor or oppose an expansion of gifted programs? I think that with all of our learners, um, it's important to realize where they are strong and uh, where we can push them to be even stronger. And so for that reason, I think it's important for our um, advanced gifted students uh, that are often very diverse in their abilities, um, I think we can work to push those students in ways that will uh, challenge their abilities. And um, I, have, uh, I'm, I work extensively in the science fair programs uh, across our province. I am a judge for the Fraser Valley Science Fair and for the Surrey School District Science Fairs. Uh, and I think this is a great way to engage uh, students in several levels of thinking about a scientific study, how to present, how to communicate about it, and how to um, complete and undertake and complete uh, a, a research project. And so I do think that it's, it's key for there to be teachers and mentors uh, for all of our students, all of our diverse students, including those that have um, neurodiverse brains that allow them to move in some directions and, and, and do uh, advanced uh, critical thinking work. Thank you, Brian. Your comments on gifted or enriched programs? Yeah, I think it's important uh, for us to move cautiously when it comes to that because, because of my belief in inclusion, that also includes these students as well. And when you have your gifted students in your schools, they bring that level of leadership opportunities. They bring that strength to your classroom. They bring those peer-to-peer -peer tutoring or tutoring opportunities. But I also do recognize that these students that are gifted need to have the opportunity to meet with each other and grow and challenge each other. And so it's important for us to have a balance of both. But I think that in your local school, they should be able to uh, meet the needs or meet the challenges of the students that come in and then providing extracurricular activities for those kids to meet and challenge each other is important as well. Thank you. Richard, thoughts on Yeah, I think programs? that there's, a, there's, a, the, there's always the issue of money. I mean, in an ideal world, it'd be nice to have like a, you know, a gifted program and that, but the reality is, I agree with Brian on that, the reality is, is that we just don't have the resources as such to deal with that. But, but, the, but the important thing is, is that gifted kids usually can work on their own and we can push them, like you said, we can push them into directions where they can develop that area. But I think to reuse our resources, um, I mean, even though I love the idea of having a gifted uh, student program, I have more of a passion towards the, um, on the, the, trauma, the trauma kids. I think that our resources probably are going to be better served there for the, the greater good. That's why I would... Take that one. Thank you. Next question is for Richard. Do you support the school board's naming policy, especially in recognizing the community's connection to its indigenous history and culture? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have no problem with that one. I mean, it's going to take me a bit to learn the name. Um, uh, you know, I've got to, I want to do it. I want to, you know, learn how to say it well. So it's, um, I, I thought it was really, 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 really good. I thought the, um, the name on the uh, south side there by the river was, was um, a good, a good, um, listening, you know, it just shows that we're listening, we're, we're trying to understand, we're trying to be um, more connected with our, um, our community, our Aboriginal community. And I also, um, the other, are you referring to the other one too, Imagine High, or just that one? No, this is uh, in, in connection to our Aboriginal, Aboriginal history and culture. So yeah, no, I, I thought that was a, a, a good move, and I, I'm hoping that um, we work well together and grow in that area. Okay. Uh, Brian, thoughts? I think it's extremely important for us to follow the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Act and making sure that we bring those uh, actions to light and making sure that we follow what the guidance and also what the demands are for the Indigenous people. And, and they've been through so much. And for us to recognize, work with them, and make sure that we... They are represented and have their culture shared and ha be able to be proud of who they are and as people is, is extremely important 
for a school, and especially in Chilliwack, because of how many different uh, indigenous peoples and tribes there are. And so, yes, I think it's extremely valuable and important for us to recognize that and share it. Thank you. Karen. I'll echo uh, both my colleagues' points here and also would like to say that the Truth and Reconciliation Call to Action, number 57, it specifically uh, pertains to using Indigenous uh, culture, history, and knowledge in our schools, making it uh, part of our curriculum to recognize where Canada has gone wrong in the past with how we have approached relationships and how we have approached reconciliation. There are a number of calls to action that that our, school, that our schools are currently taking. And as a, as a trustee, I believe strongly in this action. There are a whole set of actions that we can take uh, to be more inclusive of all of the Aboriginal uh, communities that live and work on, on the territories that we live on. The Stalo territory is where we all live and work. Thank you uh, for that. We've expanded that question into the area of the Truth and Reconciliation Act and how that might apply to the school district. And so um, you've brought that up, which leaves me the opportunity to go in and say, get prepared, because I'd like to know how you feel, I'm gonna ask all three of you, how you feel the school district could do a better job in terms of its relationship with our indigenous communities. What more things could we do? I'll give you each two minutes since I am the boss. Richard. Okay, I, um, I think first, Thing we have to do is we have to know their history. We have to we have to we have to um, understand their history. We have to learn to listen. A lot of times, we approach it with our ideas of how we think it should be or they ought to be, and we don't actually really listen. I think one of the key issues that we're just going to have to do is we're going to have to learn to listen to them, and we're going to have to learn how to um, um, to find out what what they would like and what they would need. What they see important is in their community. In the Seabird Island where I, I, was able, um, I was able to do, like this is years ago, but we did a little thing there with our company and um, it was such an eye opener for me when I saw how, how they were combining so much of their, their, um, their school was just working so hard to you know, really work on a really good educational program for their kids and I thought that was uh, Meaningful. So I think the key issue for us would be say to let, hear what they what they want. What they, I know that the school district right now is working with them and they're and they're and they're monitoring their their um, their growth and their their development in um, in their education programs. And I think that's really important that we see that. And it's rising. The thing is, I think it's rising. And I think it's like there's more of a unity. I feel there's more of a unity as we work closer together. You just tend to develop more of a unity. So it's listening and then working towards common goals that we can say this is where they want to be, this is where they want to come, and that we can work with them on that level. Brian, there. your thoughts? Two minutes. Yeah, it's important for us to build those community connections, absolutely, and inviting our tribal leaders in to share their thoughts and experiences, not just with the Indigenous groups in each school, but also with the entire school itself. It's important for us to be aware of the history and, and the people's knowledge that they bring with us. But I also want to address the point of graduation rates with the Indigenous population is lower than the average population. And so how do we work into our system better supports for our students that are struggling with mental health, that are struggling with home struggles or crisis that's going on. So many of our kids that come into our school and especially the Indigenous population, they need someone to go to or a safe place to go to. And it's important for us to make sure that we provide those supports. And I know in each of our high schools and in our elementary schools, there, there are Indigenous workers to bring that culture and that community. And those are excellent programs and those people that are involved, they're, they're doing amazing work, but I think we can always expand that and make sure that we provide the meaningful opportunities for all students to experience and, and feel that connection to that culture that is our Indigenous tribes. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, so the Aboriginal, excuse me, the Aboriginal education, uh, Aboriginal educators are currently in our schools working with some PACs and also with uh, school board members and there, there's currently a lot of, of collaboration. This is something I'd like to see increased even more. It's critical that we um, have these conversations and especially with the Aboriginal education coming together in our schools to bring 
uh, some art projects, for example, and to bring culture directly to where the students are and show them how uh, cultures evolve and how they are all different. Uh, and, and in the difference, we find our strength and our beauty. And I think um, we've been doing a lot of great work towards this, and I'd like to continue on this, especially in the area of indigenization of curriculum. This is something I know we are working at um, at the university level as well. Um, as an ecosystem biologist, we are, uh, I know that we are missing a lot of the indigenous knowledge that comes with uh, appreciating our systems as a whole, um, instead of just appreciating one simple part of it. And so this, this vast knowledge of culture and diversity that comes with Aboriginal education um, is something that certainly needs to be uh, stressed more in our schools, but I am encouraged by the levels that are happening now. They're a start, and there's much more work to be done. Thank you very much. The uh, third in our series of or questions, uh, I threw that one at you, but I appreciate you uh, all answering it. Uh, the third question is to Brian. Uh, do you think that the province's new, newly released guidelines, which were in fact released today, go far enough to protect students and teachers during this pandemic? I know that uh, teachers have been quite vocal in many districts about their feelings of safety. Uh, and there had appeared to be some tension between the public health office and uh, teachers and schools. Uh, do you think the new guidelines are going far enough? I think it's the right step. And it's, it's as a teacher myself, it's nice to know that they're actually hearing the voice of the teachers and the concerns that they have. Because when you're in a school with thousands of kids in some of our high schools, it's hard to know who's coming from what area or who they were exposed to without them even knowing. And so, yeah, as a teacher, you're always walking on eggshells because you're not sure who, who might have it or had contact with it. And so it's good that, we've, that the masks are mandated now for our high schools and our middle schools especially because it, it, just, it helps us take almost that breath of now we don't have to enforce it because we want to feel safe personally in the classroom or it's, it's mandated, right? You have to do it. Whereas before it was, I would like you to, but you don't really have to if you really didn't want to. And so that's the right step. But I also think that as schools, one of the things that amazes me is the amount of cleaning that we see now in schools, we're like, oh, shouldn't have this been the norm to begin with? Like, now that we have more staff and more cleaning supplies, we start realizing, well, isn't this what it should be as the standard in general? Not just only night cleaning, because there are that many people going in and out of schools. So it's important for us to realize that we could always do more. And what that looks like, I mean, it's going to be very complicated and it will cost money, but we can do more. But I think it was the right step that the ministry did by saying it's mandated in middle schools and high schools for sure. Thank you. Richard, comments? Well, the COVID question. The COVID <laughs> question. <laughs> I, just, I just kind of look at, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical, so I don't, and I, most teachers aren't medical professionals. So I would say, you know, trust the medical system. The medical system's there for you. We, we go to the hospital because we trust them. We trust the medical profession on all these kind of things. So if they mandate something or they say something, just roll with it. Don't get, don't get, don't, like, it's, it's so easy to start thinking, you know, we, we get on our internet and in our mom's basement and we know more about COVID-19 than the medical profession does. So I'm always, I'm always cautioning people that says, be careful, you don't get carried away with the emotion of it. Look at the practical. What does the medical system say? Let's honor it and let's move on from that point. So that's a yes. You think they are doing the new, the new guidelines are a positive step? A positive step? I would say that the new guidelines um, are, yeah, if it's a medical step, then it's a good step. Okay. Karen? I think that the new guidelines are a really good step. Having the mandated masks for high schoolers and middle schoolers is, is a good step. And I think that um, what I've noticed from the community is a lot of concern, especially from our support staff workers, our QP members that are in schools and are also parents. Um, and so we have people that are literally on the front lines here and we have to consider uh, the dangers that are present. Now, it has been established by science that young 
young children are, while they can be, they can be spreaders, um, they don't necessarily pose the same risk as many other aspects of society. So um, our, the mask mandate is now not for primary schools or elementary schools in British Columbia. I think that that one will still be an area of contention because um, the masks actually do keep us safer from the coronavirus. And that has been proven, although it is a difficult situation with smaller children. When scientists don't necessarily agree, things can become uh, difficult. And I think that it is wise for us to go with the consensus. And so I am glad to see the increased uh, measures introduced today. Thank you very much. And that was a series of three questions that turned into four, and I appreciate <laughs> your indulgence. As we clarified that, uh, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be back with more questions right after this. Welcome back, everyone. I'm pleased to be here this evening with Karen Bondar and Richard Procy and Brian Van Garderen. Uh, we're answering questions. We have a school board election coming up, and we hope that the answers they provide help you making a decision about who you'll vote for. We have a last three questions, and then we're going to have a, a summation by you folks. The first question of our last is going to, of course, Karen. Karen, why do you feel bullying has increased in our schools and what do you think could be done to reduce bullying, especially cyber and online bullying, which takes place, in fact, outside of a school? Bullying continues to be an issue that is grappled with in every school district. I think that what we are seeing now in this COVID era is the fallout from being part of a pandemic and having a huge mental health crisis along with the actual physical health crisis that's happening. I think that um, the, you know, what we have to do is we have to look at something as, as a situation. We can't necessarily come down and, and lay blame and start labeling. Um, I don't think that that's conducive to actually um, learning and communicating and sorting out what is at the, the very root of some of these problems. Um, I think that when we look at our pillars of our various platforms, the word compassion comes to my mind a lot when we are talking about the, the, the incidences of bullying. They demonstrate a lack of compassion. And that, that is something that, that is systemic and that can be changed um, in our schools. So I think that, um, you know, pink shirt days and all of these wonderful anti-bullying um, initiatives are important to draw awareness. But we are seeing that bullying is still rampant and remains an issue. It's changed in its nature. Uh, it's important for us to be strong role models in addition to having that compassion and understanding in our students, um, strong role models to, to show students how to move forward from situations, how to communicate with each other and to uh, come past our differences uh, and, and get work done and live our lives outside of our differences. We're all different. We're diverse, and that's great. Uh, and, I, and I think that bullying is something that is always of importance for our teachers, and our support staff and administrators to deal with, and certainly our students and our parents. Richard, comments? Yeah, that's, a, that's one of the areas where I'm fairly passionate about, and um, one of the reasons I, 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 I'm running as a school trustee is because I've noticed um, a zero-sum game mentality creeping into our culture, and not just on, a, on and more of an, an adult level than on a, on a thing. I think what you see, and I'll just be quick about it because I don't have a lot of time, but what we, what we see in our culture today is we see a polarization of ideas. You're either there or you're there. 
and there's no middle ground. There's no, there's no willingness to, to negotiate. There's no willingness to talk about it. And I mentioned earlier about Soji123, the same kind of thing where there's no, there's no middle ground. There's no way we can, parents can get involved with the conversation and stuff like that. That's what concerns me in our culture today. I mean, even, in, uh, I, and uh, trust me, like running for school trustee should be a pleasant experience. And it isn't always a pleasant <laughs> experience. And I think you can all identify with that. But part of the problem is, is that people just, they did, they, there's, this, there's this real strong sense of right or wrong, and, it, and, and people polarize ideas, and then all of a sudden, you know, we can't even discuss things without getting beat up. And so I, 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 I'm looking at it from an adult section, never mind the kids. I'm thinking we got to fix our own lives up. Mm. So anyways, I know i sorry about getting Thank a little Thank you, Richard. No, that's fine. Brian, thoughts on bullying? Yeah. You know what? This is, this is an issue that is in every school, like Karen said, and... It will, it will always continue to be an issue when you have your polarized views and your different thoughts. But what I do know that we could do as a trustee and as a school board is having very clear policies on what is not acceptable about discrimination and about harassment. And that includes online as well, because these students that go home, it's not your strong, mentally healthy students that are being bullied and harassed and discriminated against. It's your vulnerable students. And when they're targeted, then there are even worse outcomes that happen. And so we as a school district have a responsibility to have no tolerance towards that. Because if we allow a little bit of it to happen, then why would they stop? And so if we are very clear about what is discrimination and what is harassment and that we have no, it does not belong in our public school system, then that will send a message to the teachers, the students, a very clear message of what not to do. Thank you, and I'm glad that uh, at least one of you mentioned the adults in the room. Um, I think oftentimes uh, we can talk bravely about what bullying is and how we should prevent it, but we can sometimes be the worst examples of bullying our, ourselves. So I'm pleased that that uh, was said because I think it, it does need to be said, especially as was pointed out, uh, if you want to call it a zero-sum game or whatever you want to call it in terms of political campaigns, um, we don't have to go very far to see examples of bullying even in those. And so uh, they don't set a very good example. So I'm pleased that today we're getting along and everything is wonderful. So um, <laughs> let me ask the next question then. Um, this is a question to Brian this time. Do you believe an individual trustee should be able to be removed by the Minister of Education for conduct unbecoming a trustee? <laughs> Uh, yes, and the reason I stand behind that is because as a member of the community and as a member of the school board of trustees, it's important to realize when your views and your values and what you are pushing for no longer matches. And when you are also in a position where you're just stopped caring about the etiquette and how you look is... is damaging and I mean it's frankly it's a little embarrassing when you look at the Vancouver newspapers and Chilliwack is in the school board is in the papers again about disagreements or about about the way they their conduct and so I think it's important that it shouldn't be uh, like at a whim you can't just let somebody go because they're not getting along with them because there always needs to be that discussion and disagreements that happen and that's how the community makes those decisions but when you're being disrespectful and when you're doing things that show that you just don't really care anymore, then yes, absolutely, you should be able to be removed. Thank you. Richard, your comments? Um, the only thing I would say about that, and I mean, it sounds good. Like, I do think trustees all have to be professional. I think it's very important that we put on an air of professionalism, especially, like, one of the things that I thought about, too, is that can you imagine a university or college or a or a, 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 an employer looking for hiring somebody and they see Chilliwack and what comes to their mind is these are the top students. These are the, this, this is the schools that I know are producing competent children. Like, I think that's a really important factor and I think that the school board needs to identify that. But I, don't, I think the only thing is, is in a democratic society, um, and what power and where does power lie? And if, you, if somebody's democratically elected, um, you may not like that individual, but does the government have the right to remove them from it? Do we have the right to remove anybody that's democratically elected? I think that would be more of a legal question, so I, don't, I, would, not, I would not comment on that, on, on saying that we should just have the government has a right just to remove anything. I think the government has the right to 
interfere in a, in a democratic process if it's, I think there's written in law in the school trustee if there's a financial uh, problem. So that's, what I, that's the line I would take. Thank you. Karen? I think that uh, it's a slippery slope when we start introducing legislation to remove an elected official. That said, there have been some egregious breaches of the conduct of our trustees in the district. And so we find ourselves in a unique situation here. I don't think that all of the actions taken by some individual trustees are correct or proper. But what I do think is that uh, I will lead by example. And I think that the best thing that members of our community can do is exercise their right to vote in this by-election and in all of our elections. Uh, because ultimately, that is the power of our democracy. And um, we, we definitely have to stick with the choices that happen uh, after the democratic voting process has taken place. And so while I do agree this is a unique situation and something that is currently being addressed at the provincial level, um, it is important for all citizens in our community to exercise their right to vote. Thank you. The last question of our set, and then you get a chance to wrap up, is of course to Richard. Richard, the school board recently amended its dress code to put more of a focus on safety and be much more gender neutral. It's no longer based on modesty and aimed primarily at girls and women. Do you favor this approach or do you support the previous dress code? Well, I would, I would definitely support um, the teachers in establishing that principle in their schools. I think that every, every school would be different. Everyone would be dealing with different um, areas of the, uh, of the community. So I would, I would think the teachers should um, have the freedom or the, 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 the teachers or the school themselves should be able to determine what the dress code should look like with the, through the parents and the teachers and the principals. I would, I would leave it more of a, of, a, of a school choice. Something that would be negotiated at each particular school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Brian, your thoughts? I think it's important for us to uh, acknowledge the reason for the adjustment in the uh, dress code and it's important for us to understand why the push is for there and for people to make their own choices and to be able to choose what they would like to do and then what they would like to wear and so when you leave it up to particular schools um, it, it can be uh, concerning just because you have individuals that have they believe one way or the other and so having a universal and a very clear but also general uh, code of uh, dress code is important because it doesn't allow personal judgment to get into there where it needs to be uh, it can be interpreted wrong and so I think it is important that we the school district went that route. Thank you. Karen? I support the amendments to um, the dress code in our district. I think that it's important and so critical to our students to understand that the dress code applies to students in our district and not to students that happen to be female uh, over those that happen to be male. We also recognize now that there are many genders and there are many students who seek to represent themselves through their clothing and through their personal style. And so it is, it is refreshing to see um, the inclusion of multiple genders. It doesn't make it quite as misogynistic uh, of an issue as it has been in the past, um, simply looking at young girls and women as uh, potentially uh, objects of sexualization. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, to all of you as candidates, I want to take my hat off to you. As I've said many times interviewing you individually, I, of all people, know what it's like to campaign and what it takes on you. And uh, there are sometimes there are ups and there's often downs and it is putting yourself out to the community to be judged, and that's not an easy thing for anybody to make a decision to do. So I have the utmost respect for all of you for doing that. I think our district will be well served um, in the future as we have some really good choices to make uh, as I see it. I now am going to give you each two minutes to uh, close up and say anything you want in that two minutes, and uh, we'll start uh, this time in uh, reverse order, and we'll go with Brian first. Sure. 
Uh, I just want to thank everybody that I've been in contact with and I've had the opportunity to work with. I mean, I'm the newbie. I'm the one that people don't really know the most. And so it's been a great experience sharing my thoughts and being able to uh, show that I can be that person that could eventually be or will be the next school trustee. And so it's important for everybody to get out there and vote and share their thoughts and their opinions and and vote for who they think is the best candidate. The other piece that I would like to address too is, yes, we're going to have disagreements. There are going to be things that you don't agree with me and or with other candidates. But the important thing is, is don't attack. That's when you personally attack, that is not the way we work. That is not how a democratic society works. You do not need to put somebody on a pedestal and just constantly berate them for whatever the reason is. And I know that because I'm the one that is the newest or the least known, that I don't have that target on me. But I know that the two candidates beside me have both received their fair share of <laughs> negative attention. And I think we need to realize that what we're doing is we're running for a school board trustee. We are here to represent students and represent the community. And when you start personally attacking somebody, that's going a little too far. So I hope you go out and vote, and I hope that everybody enjoyed the debate, and I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you so much, Brian. We'll go to Richard. Oh, Brian, that was a great speech. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, um, I would like to first of all say that... Um, that doing, running as a school trustee has been this, this, this in, in some ways has been this amazing experience for me. And, um, but what I want to really say um, is it's so important that as we move into, um, as we move into more and more, especially us, you know, being more and more involved with our community on this level, it's a whole different world. Like I, I grew up, in, I grew, my, my, my role in the community has always been more to serve I was always available. I was always interested in stuff. But now I get myself in a position of leadership or the opportunity for leadership. And, it, and it, it's a game changer. And it's hard. It's really hard. But it's also, it's very, it's very challenging. But there's also a sense of, um, of this is the right thing to do. And I, 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 and I really want to emphasize that. Running in these positions, it's, it's the right thing to do. And we need people to stand up. And I really appreciate the people that have stood up for this. Because I think it's so critical as a community that people stand up for what we need to stand up for and to go forward. And remember, at the end of the day, it's about our kids. It's about our kids coming out at the end of their school year, being productive, wholesome, peep children, people, people. Like, just watching them from the beginning to end. My life has been shaped by teachers. My life has been shaped by education. And I have no doubt in my mind that there's so many people that come out of our school system that can look back and say, I was shaped by your education system. And I want to be part of that positive positive influence. Thank you. Karen? I think it's critically important for school trustees to really lead by example. And so I, I aspire to be someone who comes to the table to listen, to learn, and to understand. Um, I am grateful for all the support that I have received during this campaign, and I, I welcome the opportunity to, to know more about the intricacies of our system uh, so that I can use my skill set uh, as an educator and as a communicator uh, to, to better serve all the students in our district. Something that I've learned throughout this campaigning process is that there are uh, so many members of our school uh, systems. They essentially work like natural ecosystems uh, with many moving parts. And so it's really important for us as trustees to be able to uh, step back and look at the greater issues that face the entire system. Um, I want to say that it's so wonderful we've had the opportunity to be here tonight um, on the unseated solo territory where we, all, where we all live and work, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to lead by example, to be a role model for the students of our district, my own children, uh, and for our school systems in general. Thank you so much, and uh, I, will, I will close by saying thank you to all of you for everything you do already in our communities. Richard uh, running a business and uh, Brian who um, lives here and, and spends his life making sure that a lot of disadvantaged kids get things 
uh, get a proper education. And Karen, for the work that you already do in education for our kids, uh, thank you so much for everything that you do. This has been Chill TV's 2021 election debate, candidates for school trustee. I hope you've enjoyed watching. I hope you got some of your questions answered, and I hope you're able now to make a more informed choice on Election Day. Thank you so much. I'm your host, Clint Hames, and on behalf of our sponsors tonight, which are the Vineyard Community Center and Simpson Notaries, have a good evening.